Support for this program comes from listeners like you. To find out more, visit us online at chipbrogdon.com. Mark chapter 4, The Mysteries of the Kingdom. This is the next message in our series of teachings as we go through a chapter-by-chapter study of the Gospel of Mark. So today we will divide up Mark chapter 4 into the following sections or subtitles. First, I think we should look at what is the kingdom of God. We, We hear that word, we hear that phrase, and we see it repeated many times in scripture, and it means different things to different people based on what you have heard and based on what you have read. Uh, so from time to time, it is useful, I think, to strip away all of all of that, unlearn some things that we were taught by religion, and get a fresh foundation of what scripture means. So what is the kingdom of God? And then we will look at three kingdom parables that are revealed here in Mark chapter 4. And then we'll discuss the wind and the waves obey him. And I'm going, I'm going to connect that event to the parables. So that's going to be interesting. I don't know that I've heard anyone do this. Maybe they have. Uh, but if, if they have, I don't know because I, I just read, I study, I pray, and I share the things that God gives me. I don't listen to what uh, 50 other preachers have to say and then regurgitate what I hear from somewhere else. So it it may be that everyone is teaching it this way. If they are, I, I don't know. I've not heard it. Maybe you have, but it's going to be fun. I think you'll find it interesting and enlightening. So let's get right into Mark chapter 4. Uh, but first, let's talk about what is the kingdom of God. And to do that, I, I do want to read through several uh, scriptures. So you, you probably are already sitting there with your Bible open to Mark chapter 4, but I would ask you to leave your place there and go over to Daniel chapter 7. So I want to read a few scriptures to you to kind of lay a foundation for what is the kingdom of God. I've written a whole book on the kingdom of God. It's called The Irresistible Kingdom, and it's several hundred pages. So I'm not going to try and uh, reduce everything that I would like to say about the kingdom of God into a a one-hour teaching, but I will try to summarize what Scripture says and then make some, some quick observations as we get underway with Mark chapter 4. But uh, beginning in Daniel chapter 7, And verse 13, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. How many peoples, nations, and languages should serve him? All peoples, nations, and and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. Then verse 18, But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Wonderful. Wonderful. Wonderful promise. And then we go to Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus is giving us what is called the Sermon on the Mount. The Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 9, uh, prefacing this, Jesus is telling us not to pray like the hypocrites, but instead to pray in this manner. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Praise the Lord. Then Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, beginning in verse 20. 
Luke 17, 20. Now, when he was asked, Jesus was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, See here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. Then turn over to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Begin reading in verse 6. Therefore, when they, the disciples, had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. And then lastly, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ's at his coming. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death, for he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now, when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Not all in some, not some in all, but all in all. Pas in pas is the Greek phrase there. It means all in all. So we've read some scriptures, and believe me, there are many more scriptures that discuss the kingdom of God. But I think this sampling is enough for us to make some interesting observations about the kingdom of God. So I would give you three of them. First, the kingdom is invisible, yet it will be seen. Now, at the time that Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees, he says, you can't see the kingdom of God because it doesn't come with observation. But later on, we see that when the kingdom has come in its fullness, it will be seen. It will be visible, though it is invisible now. The second thing we learn about the kingdom of God is that the kingdom is within, yet it will fill the earth. The kingdom is within, yet will fill the earth. So these are not contradictions. These are comp complementary characteristics. It's invisible, but it will be seen. It's within us, yet it will fill the earth. And then finally, the third is that the kingdom is here, yet it will come in a greater fulfillment. So the kingdom is invisible, yet it will be seen. The kingdom is within, yet it will fill the earth. The kingdom is here, already present, now. The kingdom of God is at hand, or is now, and yet it also will come in a greater fulfillment than what we see now. So all of that simply means that we can define the kingdom of God based on these three things, 
and say that the kingdom of God exists wherever Christ has the manifest preeminence. That word preeminence just means that he is over all, all things are submitted beneath his feet, and not just in theory, but in fact. And we begin to see that. You can turn back over to Mark now as we prepare to go into Mark chapter 4. But we see what Jesus means by the kingdom of God has arrived or is at hand because he is the kingdom of God. Christ himself is the kingdom of God. But we can also see Christ being within us and yet Christ filling the earth. We can see in that sense that Christ is here. He was there on the earth doing these miraculous works, preaching and teaching the kingdom of God. And yet we believe that he will also come again in a greater fulfillment. And what we saw in First Corinthians 15 is this great finale, this great fulfillment where scripture says, then comes the end. Then comes the end. We've been through a teaching through the book of Revelation. And uh, one of the things I pointed out is that Revelation is not the end. It's the beginning of the age to come. But it's not the end. First Corinthians 15 describes the end. And the end is when death is defeated. And all things are submitted under his feet. He is ruling and reigning over all. And then he submits himself and his kingdom to God the Father so that God may fill all in all. That God may be, may be in all and may be all in all. Pas in pas. All in all. So the only way you can understand these contradictions, the invisible kingdom and the visible kingdom, the kingdom within, yet a kingdom that fills the earth, a kingdom that's already arrived, and yet a kingdom that we're looking forward to in a greater fulfillment. It simply means that the kingdom of God is a person, and the kingdom of God exists wherever this person, Christ, has the manifest preeminence. See, Jesus is Lord of all, it says in Hebrews 2, but we do not yet see all submitted to him. 1 Corinthians 15 shows us that all will be submitted to him, but all are not yet submitted to him. So Hebrews 2 is describing the present tense. We do not yet see all submitted to him. But that is the goal. And that is the ultimate outcome. But wherever one is submitted to him, then the kingdom of God exists within that person, invisibly in their heart, and and present in the present moment. We don't have to wait until we get to heaven before we experience the kingdom of God. The kingdom is within, the kingdom is invisible, and the kingdom is here because Christ in you is the hope of glory a greater fulfillment, a greater manifestation of the glory of God in Christ is coming uh, for all. So let me illustrate that for you with a simple graphic. And I just referenced in Colossians, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So there is, there is Christ in you. And in that sense, the kingdom of God has arrived. If Jesus is preeminent in your heart, if the Holy Spirit is ruling and reigning in your heart, then Christ in you constitutes the kingdom of God in you. Well, certainly you are not the only disciple of Jesus. There are other disciples of Jesus. And so from there, the kingdom of God expands to be within each disciple each disciple. So Christ is in me, but Christ is in you if you're following Jesus. So far, so good? Okay. So Christ is in you. 
Christ is in each disciple who is following after Jesus. Just as you are following Jesus, others are following Jesus, and all together we constitute the ecclesia, the called out assembly of people, called out of darkness and into his marvelous light, called out of a self-centered existence into a Christ-centered existence or a Christ-centered life. We are the body of Christ. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. This temple is not made by hands, not made with hands. God doesn't dwell in temples or church buildings made with hands, but he lives in us and walks in us. His presence is in us. His kingdom is within us. So the ecclesia is the synthesis of all those disciples, all those believers who are following the Lord Jesus. But scripture tells us that God's goal is not to be all in some, but to be all in all. So that's what we see. That God's intent is to fill the earth with his glory. Now, 1 Corinthians 15 gives us a hint by indicating he's not going to do this all at once. And just because he has done it for you and you're the first fruits just like Christ is the first fruits, and then those who are in him and those who are following after him as disciples, and then the ecclesia. It doesn't mean that he has given up on the rest of creation, but that he is using the remnant to save the rest of creation, to reach the rest of creation. That's why he sends us as ambassadors for Christ. Go into all the world and make disciples. Teach the nations, teach the Gentiles, the Gentiles, teach those who don't know. Let your light shine. Be the salt of the earth. God so loved the world. It's not that God so loved the church or God so loved those who believed in him. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us and God has already reconciled the world. And so we go forth with the good news. We've, we have discussed these things previously. But I'm illustrating how the kingdom of God goes from being within, invisible, and present to being visible, filling the whole earth, and being ultimately fulfilled in the future, even though we see and begin to taste and see that the Lord is good, and we begin to taste the powers of the age to come, it says in Hebrews. And it's in that age to come when God will complete his work of drawing all into Christ. And then God will be all in all. And so as we think about this, the progressiveness of the kingdom of God, that helps us to understand better the parables of the kingdom of God. Uh, so Let's go back over into Mark chapter 4, and Mark is going to give us three parables describing the kingdom of God. But all of this is leading up to the prophecy of Habakkuk 2.14, for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So when we are praying daily for the kingdom of God, we do that because we we know we know that we are to do that because the bread that we're praying for give us this day our what monthly bread give us this day our yearly bread give us this day our weekly bread no it's give us this day our daily bread so every day the the object of our prayers should be centered upon the kingdom and will of God. Just as much as we're praying for daily bread, we are praying daily for his kingdom to come and for his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. So there, again, is the earthly, global, universal vision of God's kingdom and God's will being done because the earth is the Lord's. It doesn't belong to the devil. It doesn't belong to man. The earth is the Lord's in the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. But this world is in darkness. And the people of this world are in bondage to sin. And whoever sins is a slave of sin. And the reason they're slaves of sin is because they've been led astray from the simplicity of Christ. Or 
The God of this world has blinded them so that they can't see the glorious light of the gospel to be saved. So these are the obstacles that you and I encounter as we go forth as light, as salt, as ambassadors for Christ. But my point is that God's goal is to save the world. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And in Abraham's seed, which is Christ, he says all the nations, all the peoples of the earth will be blessed. And so all of this supports this ultimate outcome, this ultimate vision of Habakkuk 2.14. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Hallelujah. As we said, and as Hebrew acknowledges, we do not yet see all things under him. And then Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 says, here's the ultimate end. Then the end comes, but it doesn't all happen at once, right? In Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive, but each in their own order. You have some that come right away, some that come a little after that, and some that come a little after that at the end. But the ultimate, the ultimate outcome, the ultimate result is that God will be all in all. So there is a progression and there is growth associated with the kingdom of God. He must increase, it says in John 3.30. But I must decrease. What hinders the increase of Christ is our unwillingness to decrease. We cling to sin, we cling to self, and we cling to the lies of Satan. And so these are antichrist fighting against the increase of Christ And that battle is real, but the outcome is certain and the victory has already been won. So we are simply learning how to walk in the victory that has already been obtained as opposed to trying to fight for a victory and work towards an uncertain outcome. We have the sure word of scripture where God swears by himself that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess to him. And Paul uh, zooms in on that even more by saying that it is through Christ and through God exalting him and giving him a name above every name that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess in heaven, earth, and under the earth. So this is all. God will be all in all. Okay? So we are in this great process, this great in-between time. That's why when the disciples thought that the kingdom might come, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus says it's not for you to know the time or the seasons. Well, in the first place, they misunderstood what the kingdom of God represented. They limited the kingdom of God to, to Israel. And once more... I reiterate that God's kingdom and purpose is not limited to a single nation, and it's not even limited to new Israel or to the body of Christ or to the ecclesia, the called out chosen peculiar people. But he uses the remnant. He uses the peculiar people to reach all the others. He always uses the remnant. He always uses the few to save the many. And that's, that is just something that God does. He used Joseph to save the whole nation of Israel as well as the whole nation of Egypt. Once again, demonstrating that he wishes to bless and reveal his grace and his mercy to all people in all places. So to the extent that Christ is seen, to the extent that Christ has the preeminence, to that extent the kingdom of God has come. So we see this illustrated three different ways in Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. And again, Jesus began to teach by the sea. And a great multitude was gathered to him so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole multitude was on the land facing the sea. Then he taught them many things by parables and said to them in his teaching, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the web, but by the wayside. I started to say website. I feel like uh, uh, there is a lot of seed that falls by the website, 
then <laughs> that's as far as people get and they never go any deeper. Uh, so that was a little slip of the tongue there, but maybe there's a grain of truth in it. So blessed are you who are here, who are participating, diving deep, going into the deeper mysteries of the kingdom of God. And I, I respect you and I respect your hunger and thirst for righteousness and your reverence for the word of God that you would take time to come and, and be a part of this. A lot of people will not, don't have time, too busy, other things entering in. And this is exactly the, the type of people that are being described here as Jesus teaches them about the kingdom of God. So as the sower goes out to sow, it says again in verse four, it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth. And immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched. And because it had no root, it withered away. And some seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. But other seed fell on good ground and yielded a crop that sprang up, increased and produced. Some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. And he said to them, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parable. And he said to them, To you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, all things come in parables, so that seeing they may not, they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. So let's pause right there and, and make a couple of observations before we read the, the rest of the uh, passage that gives us the interpretation. Now, not too long ago, we completed a series of teachings on all the parables of Jesus. And in fact, if you're interested in accessing that study, I'm not sure that it is linked from the website just yet. Uh, but if you want access to that, um, send me a message in the question box and say, please send me the link to the parables of Jesus, all the parables of Jesus. Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to reteach everything about the parables there, but I will highlight a couple of things that I think are important. Uh, and the first is that the purpose of a parable is not to reveal. It is to reveal. Let me, let me stop and say that again. The purpose of a parable is to reveal and not to hide. Now, when we went through this parable previously in the in the teaching and we made this point, I told you that if Jesus wanted to hide the truth, he would not be teaching at all. But the reason he is using parables is because their hearts have been hardened. So it's the hardness of their hearts that prevents Jesus from speaking plainly. And so depending on how you translate Isaiah 6, 9, and 10. The way some translations translate it, it seems like that God wants to harden their heart, that God wants to make it more difficult. And it's my understanding and belief that if it's translated correctly, it actually means the opposite. That because their hearts are hardened, because they see and they don't perceive, because they hear and they don't understand, that he's using the parable to begin to soften their hearts. So the purpose of a parable is to reveal, it's not to hide. Elsewhere in Matthew, it says that when that the, I think it's in Matthew or it may be Luke, but it says that, that when Jesus opened his mouth, to speak in parables, it fulfilled the scripture that says, I will utter things that have been hidden from the foundation of the world. So if he is revealing and uttering things that have been previously hidden, it means that the purpose of the parable is not to hide them even more. The purpose of the parable is to reveal them. Now, it's because of the hardness of people's hearts that they can't understand what Jesus is saying. It's not because he's making the parable difficult to understand. It's because the hardness of their hearts prevents them from understanding. So the parable is meant to open them up. It, the parable is given 
to to cause them to seek understanding and in seeking to understand the parable the process itself of wanting to know wanting to understand seeking the lord for wisdom and revelation in that process their hearts will be softened to receive the word that is sown and that is exactly the fulfillment of the parable so I share that with you so that you understand the proper use and the, and the proper uh, interpretation of why Jesus is using the parables. And even with the disciples, he had to explain the parables to them, and, it, and they had a hard time believing. They had a hard time understanding, and it says because their hearts were hardened. They didn't understand. And Jesus says you, you, just, you don't have enough faith. And it's it's not a a condemnation of them for not having enough faith. It just means you 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 have not learned to let go and let me lead you and teach you. You have not learned to let go and let me let go and let God let go and let me. And that's what faith is. It's when you let go and you let God. <laughs> and that is really easy to say. Let go and let God. And it's a cliche. It's a bumper sticker or a slogan. But that's really the life of faith. You let go and you let God. And in and, and all the places where he says you just uh, you don't have faith. And we're going to see that in the end of this chapter with the storm. How is it that you don't have any faith? Why are you so fearful? Why can't you trust me? So in, in all of these things, in the parables and the teachings and the miracles that he does, he's trying to draw us out and get us to see, you can trust me. You can let go and you can let me teach you. You can let me guide you. And he's inviting us to give up control and certainty for the uncertainty of faith and trust, giving him control, giving him preeminence, which is recognizing that he is Lord of all, he sees all, he knows all. And so all of these things are done to soften our hearts so that the word will produce fruit. Let's keep reading in verse 13. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? So he's saying this is a basic, this is the first parable that's being recorded. It's the foundational parable. And this is how we make sense of all the other parables. Verse 14, the sower sows the word. And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness. And they have no root in themselves, and so endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Now these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things entering in choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. But these are the ones sown on good ground. Those who hear the word accept it and bear fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. Praise the Lord. So, verse 21 as we transition into the parable of the growing seed. Also, he said to them, verse 21, is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed? Is it not to be set on a lampstand? For there is nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret but that it should come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Then he said to them, take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. For whoever has, to him more will be given. But whoever does not have, even what he has, will be taken away from him. So again, let's pause and make a, make a point. First of all, the parable of the growing seed that he is about to 
present this parable is unique to Mark. It's not recorded in Matthew. It's not recorded in Luke. It's not recorded in John. Mark is the only one that records this parable of the growing seed. But he introduces this parable by making the point that this parable is going to show us how it is the nature of the kingdom of God to grow and to increase. And since the kingdom of God is really Christ growing and increasing in us and in each disciple and in the ecclesia and in all of creation, then he must increase, John 3.30. So it's not only showing Christ in us, but it's showing how we also will grow in wisdom and revelation as Christ is in us, that God himself will perfect and will complete the good work that he has begun in us. So now let's read verse 26, the parable of the growing seed. And he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground and should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. For the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, after that the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Well, as I say, this parable is unique to Mark. And so therefore, it is something that we want to highlight and focus on. Because if it were not for Mark, it would not be recorded anyplace else. So what is the significance of this? Well, first it says that the seed sprouts and grows. Why? Well, because God makes it grow, because the man who is watching it grow has no idea. He himself does not know how it grows. In 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about how one sows and another reaps, but it is God who gives the increase, or one sows and another waters what is sown. But it is God who gives the increase. So the seed sprouts and grows because God makes it to grow. And what this means is, and this is why we have to have faith. That's why Jesus says, have faith in God. Believe You believe in God, believe also in me. And faith and belief is just another word for trust. It's a relationship word. Faith is not intended to be a religious word, although we take that word faith and belief and we turn it into a religious function, a doctrinal statement of beliefs. But really, faith and belief is supposed to be a relationship word that simply means trust. So the man doesn't know how it grows, and yet it does grow because because God makes it grow. And the truth of the matter is we can sow seed and we can water it and we can try to take care of it, but we can't make anything grow. We can't even make ourselves grow. And that's the whole point. With man, it is impossible. And the sooner we embrace the impossibility of man, the sooner we can embrace the possibility with God. Because with man, it is impossible. With you, it is impossible. With me, it is impossible. And that's why I say stop looking to other people to provide something or to be something that only God can provide and only God can be in your life. With man, it is impossible, but with God, all things are possible, Jesus says. You can plan it, you can take care of it, and you can you can watch it like a hawk, but you can't make that thing grow, but it's going to grow of itself. It's going to grow because God created it to grow. So this is what I'm calling the rest of faith, entering into his rest. And it simply means we trust that God is who he says he is. We trust that God is going to do what he says he's going to do. And if he tells us to do thus and so, then we're going to obey him because we love him, not because we're afraid that he's going to strike us with lightning if we don't obey something he tells us to do. That's the that's the wrong 
way to look at this relationship. And that's actually not rest anyway. That's keeping you on pins and needles all the time, afraid that you're going to step out of line. That's a spirit of religion. That's not the spirit of Jesus. So when we realize that with man it is impossible, it's impossible with you, it's impossible with me, it's impossible with the most spiritual person you know. I don't care who they are, how spiritual they are, how knowledgeable they are, how anointed they seem, how gifted they think they are. With man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible, Jesus says. And the sooner we embrace that impossibility, the sooner we can step into the possibility of faith that with God all things are possible apart from him I can't do anything but in him and through him I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me so that's the rest of faith it doesn't mean that you never do anything it just means you don't do anything in your own strength because you know in me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing and with man it is impossible But with God, all things are possible, and that's the life of trust. And so just like in the first parable, and all three of these parables have three three levels of growth or three levels of return. So in the parable of the sower, we saw 30, 60, and 100-fold return. And here in the parable of the growing seed, we have three stages of growth. The earth yields crops by itself. There's the blade, then the head, then the full grain in the head. So again, three stages of growth. Doesn't happen all at once. Not according to the time and season that that we want, but according to the time and season that God ordains and establishes. It's not for us to know the times and the seasons. That's the other thing. It's impossible with man. Even if I gave you the times and seasons and told you, it would be impossible for you to understand it. So he says it's not for you to know. That's another thing that causes us to trust God and to rest. We can rest, we can relax, and we can know that it's up to God to order and ordain the times and the seasons according to his own will and purpose. And when we stop trying to be God, when we stop looking at our watch and thinking thinking that God is running behind schedule, when we stop trying to be the Holy Spirit for everybody else and tell them what they should be doing or should not be doing, where they should go, where they shouldn't go, what they should think, what they shouldn't think, what they should believe, what they shouldn't believe. Just stop all of that. Stop trying to be the Holy Spirit to everybody else and let God be God. Let the Holy Spirit lead his own people. You just focus on the rest of faith, trust, and obey. You will begin to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus, and you will experience the peace that comes with letting God be God. That brings us to parable number three, which is the parable of the mustard seed. So we'll pick up reading in verse 30 of Mark 4. Then he said, To what shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what parable shall we picture it? It is like a mustard seed, which, when it is sown on the ground, is smaller than all the seeds on earth. But when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all herbs and shoots out large branches so that the birds of the air may nest under its shade. Now, this parable is also in Matthew 13, and we've also discussed this parable in um, in previous teachings, so I'm not going to belabor it for you again. But basically, this parable, now I know other people will interpret it differently, but I believe this parable shows how the birds of the air will try to spoil the kingdom of God. Just as the birds of the air devoured the seed that fell by the wayside. So we know the birds of the air are the devil. 
represents Satan, Jesus says, when they hear Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. He says, this is the birds of the air who came by and devoured the seed that fell by the wayside. So why all of a sudden with the, with the birds of the air, you know, just a few minutes later, now the birds of the air are something good. No, they represent the devil coming to spoil this kingdom of God that is growing from a seed. Now, he won't be successful in the long term, but in the short term and in the interim, we see that the devil has been successful to the extent that he is able to lead many people away from the simplicity of Christ. Just like Paul told the Corinthians, and this is what I keep referencing over and over again because it's still applicable to our time today. He says, I fear for you that just as Eve was beguiled by the subtlety of the devil, that you also would be led astray, that your minds would be corrupted, your hearts would be corrupted, that you would be led astray from the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. Well, the far side of simplicity the, sim- the far side of the simplicity of Christ is the complexity of religion. And that's where most people who think they are following Jesus, that's where they find themselves today, drowning in the complexity of religion instead of walking in the simplicity of Christ. My heart's desire for you is that you walk in the simplicity of a Christ-centered faith that is based on a relationship, not based on religion. Because what has happened is the kingdom of God was planted from a mustard seed, the smallest of seeds. It grew just as God intended it to grow. But these large branches have come out of it, and now the birds of the air are nesting in those branches. Again, we have here three stages. There is the seed, the stalk, and the branches. So first the smallest of seeds, and then it begins to grow up, and then out of that trunk or out of that stalk or the main the main growth of that comes all of these branches branching out. And I would say to you that is the religious system. Those are the branches of denominationalism. Christ is the seed. The stalk represents the apostles, the early ecclesia. And those branches, those large branches coming out represent the religious system going in every direction and becoming a nesting place for the birds of the air, which is the devil. Now, Matthew also supports this idea with his parable. So I'm I'm not just pulling this out of the air and saying this is what I think, but when we went through the parables and we looked at the seven kingdom parables that are recorded in Matthew, see, Mark only gives us three here, and one of them is not given anywhere else. Matthew gives us seven. And when you look at those seven in context and consider them all together, this is how we get the interpretation of the of the mustard seed and the birds of the air and the religious system. So it, it's not just a parable. It's a prophecy. It's telling us what's going to happen. People will be led astray from the simplicity of Christ once the once the apostles, the apostolic, the first few uh, couple of centuries of the early ecclesia once christianity uh, moves away from the relationship to become a religion to become institutionalized then it becomes this huge unnatural thing with branches going everywhere and the birds of the air because it's too late for them to devour the seed It's, it's too big for them to stop it And so whatever the devil cannot destroy, he seeks to defile. Whatever the devil cannot destroy, the birds would prefer to eat the seed. But if the birds can't eat the seed, then they will simply defile that which grows out of the seed. So it's not just a parable, it's a prophecy. It's telling us what's going to happen in the time from Jesus all the way up to the present moment. Now, if those branches are not producing fruit, it's it's going to be cut off. And John 15 gives us the, the basis for that.
So then verse 33, it says, And with many such parables he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. But without a parable he did not speak to them. And when they were alone, he explained all things to his disciples. So again, it's repeating Jesus is teaching as they are able to hear it. He is trying to help them understand. But when your heart is hardened and the soil is is like concrete, it's not receptive to the truth. And so Jesus is speaking to them in parables to try and soften their heart so that it, it will not just be seed that is wasted and that is falling by the wayside. His purpose is not to hide the truth, but to reveal the truth. So his purpose is to to set us free with the truth. It's not to hide the truth, but he, he uses parables and other things to try and get us to cooperate with the receiving of the revelation. Well, then, as we begin to close up, we come to Mark chapter, uh, it should be Mark chapter 4, but we come to verse 35. On the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose. And the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? And how is it? that you have no faith. And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Wow, I just love that slice of life from Jesus and his ministry around the Sea of Galilee. So much has happened around this Sea of Galilee. This little lake in northern Israel, out in the country, far away from Jerusalem, all of these mighty things are happening, all of these miracles, all of these powerful things. But I would suggest to you that there is more going on here than just Jesus calming the storm, which by itself is pretty significant and and pretty awe-inspiring in and of itself. But I tend to look at things in terms of their prophetic significance as well. So the, the first thing I would point out to you is that it says on the same day when evening had come on the same day signifies to me that what's about to happen is somehow connected to the teaching. So it's not random that it appears in the same chapter or random that it appears right after the parables or that Mark especially mentions on the same day something significant happens. Because I think Jesus is about to demonstrate what he has already taught in parables. And sometimes experience is really the best teacher. As a teacher, I try to make things as plain as possible. But really, if you haven't experienced it, you're at a disadvantage. But once you experience something, you get it. Then you're able to teach other people. And so Jesus is teaching not only in his words, but also with his deeds and with the experiences that he brings them through. Remember, he called them to be with him, not just to sit at his feet and hear his word, which is important, but to go with him through these different experiences and learn something in the doing, learn something in the experience. So on the same day, to me, that signifies that something is happening that is connected to these teachings. But what is the connection? Well, we know that Jesus will eventually send them into all the world. He'll send his apostles out, his disciples. We we were just reading that in Acts chapter 1. 
that beginning in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth, that they are to go and, and preach the gospel of the kingdom. So the seed has been planted, and now it's it's growing and going forth. And Jesus will eventually send them out into all the world, just like he sent them across the sea here. He said, let's cross to the other side. So they all get into the boat, and they all begin to cross the other side. But I would suggest to you that the winds and the waves here, and they're real winds and waves. This is a real storm, don't get me wrong. But I think there's a prophetic significance here as well. And it shows how even with, while they are in the process of going into all the world, that the wind and the waves of religion will threaten to sink their boat. That's why Paul says, I'm afraid of you, Corinthians, that you're going to be led astray from the simplicity of Christ. Peter warned them about false teachers among them entering in. John said the spirit of Antichrist is here. It's already out into the world. So this was not new or surprising, but this was expected. And when you compare Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 15, and I want to read them to you, it sets a context for this event. It says that he himself, God, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. For the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the epignosis, or the full knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, meaning a mature person, a spiritually mature person, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And what's the benefit of that? Verse 14 that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Well, we see the body of Christ growing and, and spiritually becoming uh, edified and more and more being built up in love, but it's growing up into Christ growing up into Christ. And until you are spiritually mature in the Lord, meaning that you have forsaken religion and you have embraced relationship, then Paul says, until we get to that point, then we will be like children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. The doctrine is the teaching, and it's specifically it's religious teaching. Tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of religious teaching by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Well, who's trying to trick people with religious teaching? It's not sinners out in the world. It's real, it's In Paul's time, it was... Those who said, for example, that unless you are circumcised according to the law of Moses, you can't be saved. And they were preaching Jesus to the Jews only. And Paul says, no, that this Savior, Jesus, he's the Savior of all men, especially those who believe. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We pray for all men that they would be saved and would come to the full knowledge of the truth, for he is the Savior of all not just the Savior of Jews only, but also to the Gentiles, which means everybody. But you see, tossed to and fro, just like the disciples there in the boat, tossed to and fro because they had not yet grown up into Christ. And so, prophetically speaking, we see the wind and the waves of religion buffeting them, tossing them to and fro, 
and threatening their mission of good news to the whole earth. And meanwhile, where is Jesus? Well, he's asleep in the back of the boat. Just like right now, Jesus, it seems like it that he is asleep. While we wait for his return, while we expect his return, in the meanwhile, we are struggling in the wind and waves of religious institutionalism, the traditions of men that threaten to sink our ship and lead us astray from the simplicity of Christ. But, you know, they begin to cry out to the Lord at that point. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And in the same way, and maybe not in the sense of accusing the Lord, but in the sense of calling out to the Lord, at least they knew where to go. In the same way we pray daily for his kingdom to come and his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, not that he would evacuate us from the earth. I'm not looking for Jesus to return so that he can rescue me from the earth. The earth belongs to the Lord and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. We're praying daily for his kingdom to come and his will to be done for Christ to return, for he is the kingdom. We're praying for his return, not to rescue us from the earth, but for him to deliver the earth. This whole creation that groans and travails in pain, Paul says, it groans and travails as it it awaits its deliverance from vanity and corruption. So it's not praying that God will take us out of the world and into heaven. It's praying that God will bring heaven into the earth and Christ will return and restore all things, put all things under his feet, make all things new. That's all happening here on the earth. So in the same way the disciples, <laughs> they thought that they would perish. And in the same way, sometimes I, I wonder and I'm concerned that a religion about Jesus has just about drowned a relationship with him. But that's not the case either. There is a remnant And at some point, Jesus will arise, just as he arose in the boat, and he spoke peace. He rebuked the wind, and he said to the sea, peace be still, and the wind stopped blowing, and there was a great calm. In the same way, when Jesus returns to subdue all things, he is going to bring his judgment upon those things that represent him hypocritically. He will reveal his truth and and the essence of who he is to all, and he will expose the religious system as a hypocritical system. So when Jesus returns to subdue all things, then he will make all things new. This, again, we see in several different parables where the last will be first and the first will be last and those who thought they were in will be cast out and those who thought they were cast out will be let in. He returns to turn everything upside down and to set things in the proper order. So the point of this event, as well as the point of the prophetic significance of this event, is to show that there is great peace and calm when Jesus has the preeminence. When Jesus is Lord, when all things are submitted beneath his feet, there is a great peace and a great calm. Now, in the world it says we will have tribulation, and that's going to be the case, but he says, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And we may not have peace in the world because Jesus is not does not have the manifest preeminence in the world, Not yet. We do not yet see all things submitted to him. But we can have and we can let the peace of God rule in our hearts. And if we will follow him and give him the preeminence, whether anyone else does or not, then the kingdom of God has arrived and we don't have to be tossed around by the wind and the wave of religion or any other thing that threatens our peace. 
and threatens to distract us and lead us astray from the simplicity of Christ. But we will have peace and calm and quiet so long as he has the preeminence and we are submitted to him, to his will and to his kingdom. The mysteries of the kingdom of God are revealed in the parables and prophecies of Scripture. So what we have seen is that the kingdom is invisible, yet will be seen. The kingdom is within, yet it will fill the earth. The kingdom is here, but it's going to come in a greater fulfillment in the future. And this kingdom exists wherever Christ has the manifest preeminence. Not just in word, not just in theory, but in fact. And when Christ has preeminence, the winds and waves of religious bondage will cease buffeting our boat, and instead a great calm will settle over our hearts and over all creation. For the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. If you'd like to get additional teachings, audio recordings, books, and other Christ-centered resources to help you grow spiritually, visit us online at chipbrogdon.com.